Hello, my name is Tim Brophy, and welcome to this module on the basics of student learning outcomes assessment. Before you begin the module, though, please go to the materials link and download and print this particular file called the Guide to Writing Student Learning Outcomes. This is one that I post on our institutional assessment website and I have it attached with this module because as we go through this presentation you might want to flip through the this particular guide because I've discussed the various sections in it as we work through today's work. What is our goal today? Basically, I'm going to simply describe and explain and introduce to you the basic elements of student learning outcomes, and that is how to develop them, how to write them, and also how to measure them. And I'll wrap up with a nice example from one of the programs here at the university. Let's think first, though, why we have to do this. Well, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools is our accreditor. The Commission on Colleges section of that organization comes to our university every 10 years, accredits our institution, but also expects us to collect data annually on student learning outcomes. And here is the standard that they require. Basically, this is standard 3.3.1. It's available on the SACSCOC.org website if you want to go find their standards. It's right there. That the institution identifies expected outcomes, assesses the extent to which it achieves these outcomes, and provides evidence of improvement based on the analysis of the results of, of each of the following areas. And this is called institutional effectiveness. And the area we're talking about today are educational programs to include student learning outcomes. Now, the other areas of institutional effectiveness that we won't talk about today that this particular standard applies to are academic and student services, administrative support services, research, and also community and public service. So this is a very big and important standard for our accreditation at the institution. And it's important that all of us participate in, its in, in the um, uh, measurement and assessment of student learning outcomes and student learning at the university in order to comply with this important standard. So let's look at the first part of what we're going to talk about today, and that has to do with student learning outcomes. What, are this, what is a student learning outcome? Well, it's pretty simple. It's basically defined generally as what students are expected to know uh, and be able to do at the completion of their undergraduate or their degree program, whether it be a graduate, professional certificate, or undergraduate program. So we have a categorical organizing framework for these student learning outcomes at the University of Florida. The under... Excuse me, there we go. <laughs> okay, it's a tricky little uh, slide here. All right, the undergraduate programs basically must have three areas of student learning outcomes. These are content, knowledge, critical thinking, and communication. Now, these are a requirement of the Board of Governors, and it's Regulation 8.016, and you can read that regulation in full on the Institutional Assessment website at the Student Learning Outcomes Resources link if you'd like to see that. And all of our undergraduate and, uh, degree programs do indeed have student learning outcomes within these three categories. Well, our graduate school has also developed three areas of student learning outcomes for our graduate programs and professional programs. Now, the content knowledge, professional behavior, and skills are the three categorical areas for student learning outcomes in those programs. And most of our graduate and professional programs have submitted student learning outcomes in those three areas. <laughs> okay, recency, relevance, and rigor are important things to keep in mind in all of our student learning outcomes. First, um, we know that student learning outcomes reflect the curriculum and the faculty expectations and the discipline itself, and recency really has to do with just the degree to which the outcomes reflect current knowledge and practice in the discipline. So it is really a faculty responsibility to re revise student learning outcomes periodically to keep them recent and relevant to the degree pro or to the discipline itself because the relevance has to do with the degree to which the outcome actually logically relates to the discipline and to the degree. And finally, rigor has to do with the degree of academic precision and thoroughness that the outcome requires to be met successfully. So we expect that all of our student learning outcomes and all of our faculty are working to keep our outcomes rigorous, relevant, and recent. So let's work now on thinking about some of the distinguishing characteristics between some of the terms that sometimes get a little bit convoluted and sometimes conflated in our discussions. So first of all, let's talk about distinguishing outcomes from outputs. 
Outputs basically describe what we do, who we reach, the products we, pr we produce, or the services we produce. So basically, processes deliver outputs, so we have a number of things that we can count. Okay, and what's produced at the end of a process is an output. So what is an outcome instead? Well, an outcome differs from an output in that it's a level of performance or achievement. It okay? can be associated with a process or its output, but outcomes imply measurement. That is a quantification of performance. An outcome has to do with the de degree to which an output perhaps meets a measure, or a, um, the measure of quality that we've already determined in our programs. So what is the difference? Well, you know, we do seek to measure outputs as well as outcomes, okay? Uh, for uh, SLOs, though, focus on outcomes. So let's keep that in mind as we go through. So, for example, we might produce a number of new graduates. Okay, that's an output, all right? But that number doesn't really tell us anything about the quality of the graduates that we have produced in our program. So the outcome then defines the quality of the, out, of the uh, graduate that we produce. So there's a really good example of the distinction between outcome and output. Output is the number of graduate. Outcome has to do with the quality of those graduates and what they know and what they're able to do at the end of their program. Effective student learning outcomes describe in measurable terms, and in measurability is something we're going to get into very shortly here, these quality characteristics, basically by defining our expectations for our students. And these, of course, for undergraduate programs and now in graduate programs are located in the catalogs. So let's ask a few questions here, okay? I'll take you through a couple of uh, exercises. Here is, a, here is a question I'd like you to ask. Is this an output or an outcome, all right? Our program graduated 25 students in spring 2011. So the first question you ask yourself, is this counting a certain number or is this actually measuring the quality of something in our program? Well, you know that this is an output because we're simply talking about the number of students that we graduated. We haven't said anything about the quality of those graduates or what they, were, what they know and are able to do at the end of their program. Let's take a look at another one. 80% of our students achieved a level 4 out of 5 on our presentation assessment rubric. Well, does this have to do with the quality of our students? Well, let's take a look. This is indeed an outcome because when you are saying that 80% of your students achieved a level 4 out of 5, you're measuring the quality of their, of the output, the student, okay, you're measuring the quality of their work, and this then becomes an outcome when we can state this in terms of the percentage of students. Now what we don't have here is the number of students that comprise the 80%. So 80% of 100 students is 80 students, 80% 80 of 10 students is 8 students. So it's important when you're reporting data in Compliance Assist, which is another module that I've already shared with you in an earlier uh, session, be sure to let us know when you're reporting this information how many students ha actually make up that 80%. Now let's talk about distinguishing student learning outcomes, or SLOs, and program goals. We know that student learning outcomes are, they describe student learning, that is what we expect students to have learned or know and be able to do at the end of an academic program. Okay, uh, now program faculty also set targets for their student learning outcomes, that is they will set a percentage of students that they consider to be an appropriate percentage to have met the outcome in order for their program to be considered successful. And the University Academic Assessment Committee has set that minimum limit at 70%. So if any program has set a criterion for success or a SLO target of less than 70%, you need to provide a rationale for that when you report this data in Compliance Assist. Now, a program goal, on the other hand, simply describes a program's programmatic expectations having to do with things like the acceptance rate, the admission criteria, the graduation rates, the attrition rates. Those kinds of things also are measured by programs, but they're not related to student learning outcomes. They're related to programmatic goals. So now let's do a couple of exercises here, a couple of questions. Tell me, is is this a program goal or a student learning outcome? And that is, students dis identify and describe major events in American history from 1770 to 1800. Well, this is actually a student learning outcome because students are having to demonstrate something that they know. It's also written in a measurable way because we can measure identification and descriptions of major events. So, it all, so 
that's a good example of a student learning outcome. Here is an example, <laughs> sorry again, uh, a program goal. I'll go ahead and put that up there since it went there anyway. And that 10% uh, will lower our attrition rate by 10% because this doesn't have to do with student learning. It has to do with the program itself and the uh, elements of programmatic importance to all of our programs at the university. Now, we want to make sure that, we, that our outcomes are indeed measurable. Now, how, there are some ways we can ensure that. Okay. We know that effective student learning outcomes really focus on what students know and are able to do because we know that all disciplines have this body of core knowledge and skills that students must learn to be successful as well as the core set of applications of that knowledge in the degree programs, so in professional settings. So also effective student learning outcomes really do describe observable and measurable actions or behaviors. So there is something that we can actually observe and measure that is implied in the student learning outcome if it's written in a measurable way. All right, so we know that our measurement tools at the university vary from exams to really some rather complex tasks that are rated by similarly complex analytic rubrics. Continuing on with this discussion, we know that the key to measurability in an outcome is that an active verb that describes this observable process or behavior or the product itself. So there is a framework for developing student learning outcomes and that's in this guide that I think you're using to follow along as we talk about this and that's the Bloom's Taxonomy. Uh, in the Bloom's Taxonomy there are several tables that I provide for you in the guide that give you actual lists of verbs that are actually recommended and of course you can add more to them uh, but you want to start with this list because it's a pretty good one. So there are some verbs and phrases that we tend to think and that are okay, but they really do complicate measurability, and I'll explain why. First of all, the word understand. Now, we all want our students to understand things. We know this. All right, so that is perhaps a program learning goal, but not a good outcome. Why? Because understanding is an internal process. It's only indicated by them doing something to show you that they understand. So the outcome itself is written in measurable terms and using verbs like describe, identify, explain, deliver, present, um, de um, you know, so these are words that you can use to help define and describe exactly what the uh, outcome is and not use the word understand. Appreciate and value are also internal processes. They're really demonstrated behaviors that are really closely tied to personal choice or preference. So first of all, even though we expect we might want to expect students to appreciate or value something, we want to tie that to some kind of measurable behavior and measurable uh, outcome that we're able to actually then validate and rationalize why that particular result indicates appreciation or valuing and why that's important to the discipline. Finally, and then Becoming familiar with, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with this still, okay, uh, becoming familiar with is another one of those tricky phrases that really complicates measurability because it really focuses the assessment on becoming familiar and not actual familiarity. So I would have recommend that you not use that phrase. We might wish for our students to become familiar with something. But the measurement of that is actually with the familiarity and how we actually describe that familiarity in terms of measurable verbs. <clears throat> Learning about, thinking about, these are also internal processes that are very difficult to measure because they're demonstrated through specific actions that can be described by the verbs that you see in the list in table three in the guide. Okay, so also becoming aware of, gaining an awareness of, this really focuses the assessment on the becoming or the gaining rather than the actual awareness of it. And I think you can really describe the actual awareness pretty well in your student learning outcome if you use an active verb that really focuses the measurement on what it is you want the students to demonstrate or to show. And then demonstrate the ability to. Really, uh, this demonstrating an ability focus the assessment on the ability and not on the actual doing of it, okay, the actual uh, skill or the achievement of that skill or the demonstration of that skill. So revise your student learning outcome not to say the ability to, but actually to 
measure a specific action. And again, this will become clearer as I show you an example a little bit later. So there's a three-level model that I'd like to introduce to you by Ron Caravo. His book um, is, was written in 2010, and it's a really good one. This three-level model basically starts with the program learning goal level. Programs establish learning goals for a degree. Now, these require multiple actions to measure. We know this. Um, and these also can be found in the academic learning compacts. And the academic learning compact is where you tell students exactly what it is that you expect them to know and be able to do by the end of the degree. And it's at this level where you can say, yes, I want them to understand this or be able to do something like this at the learning goal level. However, the student learning outcome level is different. These describe exactly what students are going to be able to do and demonstrate okay, that how they've met their learning goal which is a different process entirely. Then at the course level, uh, these really are determined by the faculty, and these really specify the course level observable products or demonstrations, assignments, projects, and so forth. And these are going to be um, where often the assessments that are used for the outcomes are located, but that's an, a degree program faculty decision as to uh, which of the actual course assignments and projects and so forth become the, the degree program measurements. So what this does is, is it allows you to develop the assessments here uh, that measure outcomes and then they connect directly all the way up to the learning goals for the degree program or to your academic learning compact. So let me ask you this, are the following outcome statements measurable? Let's find out. Students understand good writing style. Well, I say no because there's that word understand. What this does is an outcome, it doesn't really tell us what students are going to do to be able to demonstrate their understanding of good writing style. Are they going to write? Are they going to review something that's in a particular style? We don't know that. That's not clear. So in my view, this is difficult to measure. Could be measured, I suppose, if you want to really use the word understand. But it's really not the best way to go about doing this. Now, if you say this one, students side sing a 16 measure melody with no errors. Well, there is an example of something that's very specific. You know exactly what the students have to do. You know exactly what the outcome is. They either side sing it or they don't because there are no errors allowed. So this would become an outcome. It is certainly measurable as an outcome. It really is pretty clear what you have to do to measure this one. The last thing I want to share with you before we move into the example is that you need to really balance your assessments. What do we mean by that? Well, we have two kinds of assessments, direct and indirect. And the direct assessments are those really that provide a direct examination of learning. You're very familiar with these because these are exams, uh, assignments, uh, directly measured against some kind of performance indicator, whether that performance indicator is a score or a level of a rubric that you're using. Whereas indirect measures, on the other hand, are those that really ascertain the self-report or opinion of the extent or value of learning that students have. So we have evaluations that the students give us every semester uh, as a result of their time with us. And there is a great deal of indirect assessment there. We also have the data that's available to all program faculty from the student experience in the research university or CRU assessment or survey that's done every two years. It was done in 2009 and 2011 and it's being completed again in 2013. At the time of this module being recorded, that data is due at any time. So what we want to do now is see if we can balance these assessments in our programs. You should have at least one direct measure, at least one indirect measure, so you can actually then later uh, triangulate those results and really come up with a meaningful result and a meaningful analysis of the success of your program and the student learning that's going on in your program. So here's an example of either a, a direct or indirect assessment. Is it a direct or indirect? Well, it's pretty clear that this is a direct assessment because this is a midterm exam, it's a content knowledge exam or it could be a skill exam, it doesn't matter what kind of content or skill that you're measuring, but the point is it's direct. We're looking, we're observing directly what students know and are able to do. 
here, the Sears survey, of course, I just kind of gave that away in my previous talk. This is, an in, this is an indirect assessment. And again, this one is available to all faculty on our campus. So here's a sample undergraduate program all right, at the University of Florida. I'm just going to borrow this, and I did get permission to use this, and I appreciate the faculty for allowing me to do this. This is material science engineering. Level one, they've established learning goals for this degree. How did they do that? Well, they did this in their um, academic learning compact, okay? They're found in the description of the major, the program mission, the program website, and in their academic learning compact. So let me get out of the way and let you see this one. All right, this one, clearly, and if you don't mind, I'll just read it to you. The major enables you to develop an understanding of material systems and their role in engineering. And again, here the word understanding is perfectly appropriate because it's a learning goal. All right, emphasis is placed on the ability to apply knowledge of mathematics. And again, ability is okay here because it's a learning goal. All right, um, science and engineering principles to material science and engineering, to design and conduct experiments, as well as to analyze and interpret data and to design a system, component, or process to meet desired needs within realistic constraints such as economic, environmental, social, political, ethical, health and safety, and manufacturability and sustainability. So that's quite a compact. Okay, I'll step back into the screen here and go to the next one. So the student learning outcomes for the material science and engineering program mirror this and directly from it. All right, again, we have those three categorical designations of content knowledge, critical thinking, and communications because this is an undergraduate program. So here are their content knowledge, student learning outcomes, to apply knowledge of mathematics, science, and engineering principles to material science and engineering, and to design and conduct materials, science, and engineering experiments, and analyze and interpret the data. So here we have a lot of active verbs. They're going to be easily measured because the application, design, the con uh, conducting of experiments, the um, analysis and interpretation of data are all actions that are observable and measurable. Take a look at critical thinking. Here they're asking them to design a material science and engineering system, component, or process to meet desired needs within the realistic, economic, environmental, social, political, ethical, health and safety, manufacturability and sustainability constraints. Again, a very specific outcome that has a very specific measurable component to it, that is the design of the, of the system component of the process. And finally, in communication, they communicate technical data and design information effectively in speech and writing to other materials engineers. So here, this outcome again is measurable because the communication piece is in writing and in speech. So they're going to clearly be able to assess the writing, their presentations to other material science engineers, and they'll be able to determine the degree to which students have met the outcomes. So these are their student learning outcomes related to their learning goals that were expressed in the Academic Learning Compact. So let's connect these goals to outcomes. Again, I'm going to step off the screen here so you can actually see these. So here you see the learning goal on the left to understand material systems and their role in engineering and to design a system component or process to meet desired needs within realistic constraints. And on the right, you'll see the student learning outcome that aligns with this, okay? Here, they're very active. Design a material science and engineering system, and then the second one to communicate technical data and design information effectively in speech and in writing. So here, the goal and the SLOs align perfectly. And again, if you look here, level one is the goal level, level two is the outcome level, and again, you'll see that the understanding material science and system, excuse me, material systems in, in their role in engineering and applying knowledge of mathematics in the, in the learning goals lines up perfectly with the student learning outcomes, apply knowledge of mathematics, science, and engineering principles to material science and engineering, and then to design and conduct material science and engineering experiments and analyze and interpret the data. Now, what they've done here, uh, stay off, I'll have to stay off the screen for just another minute. Um, you see they're connecting program student learning outcomes to their courses now in their curriculum map in their program. Now I get into the curriculum mapping uh, when we, when you, if you take the um, module called academic assessment planning, I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. But here now there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the courses and the student learning outcomes. And here they're following the university's um, key of I for introduce, um, 
R for reinforce and A for assess, having to do for when the instant having to do with the, when the student learning outcomes are introduced, reinforced, and assessed in the program. So here you'll see that the content knowledge student learning outcomes numbers one and two are introduced, reinforced, and assessed in those three courses. And then critical thinking, you'll see those courses are also listed there where they're introduced, reinforced, and assessed. And communication, the same thing. They also have an additional assessment because they actually have a senior exit interview that serves as their indirect assessment. So the assessments in the boxes marked A as they write in their assessment plan are conducted using specific homework exam or assessment questions aligned with that student learning outcome. Now if you go to the assessment.aa.ufl.edu website and you look up the undergraduate academic assessment plans, you'll find there the material science and engineering academic assessment plan from which this came. You simply open up the window that's for the College of Engineering and scroll down and you'll see their academic assessment plan there. And this came directly from that plan. Okay, I'm back on the screen again. Let's talk now about the course level student learning outcomes because these really are determined by the faculty. The Office of Institutional Assessment does not examine those, nor are we interested in examining those. What we are interested in, though, is advising you that these outcomes for every course should link to the student learning outcomes for the academic program itself, because that is what we monitor in the Office of Institutional Assessment. Remember, all of the core student learning outcomes should relate directly to the program student learning outcomes as well. So let's just have a quick review here before we wrap this up. All right, remember, the Academic Learning Compact, that is what's in the catalog, should state the learning goals for the program. And that's where you can use words like understand, ability to, and so forth. Then the student learning outcomes, though, use active verbs to state what students will do to exhibit their acquisition of the knowledge and the skill or the behavior that's the focus of the student learning outcome. So they differ from the academic learning compact in that regard. Remember, we want to try to avoid verbs that complicate measurability because when my office reviews the student learning outcomes that you submit, and we do this every year, we will write you back and ask you, if you use words that seem to be complicating measurability, how you're measuring your outcomes. Then you need to collect data annually. Okay, now in the Academic Assessment Plan module that you can also see as part of this uh, series of modules from Institutional Assessment, you know that your student learning outcomes can be measured over a period of up to three years. Some programs choose to measure their outcomes annually, all of them annually. Some will do it on a two-year cycle, some do it on a three-year cycle. But the point is, in this particular bullet, is that some student learning outcomes, the ones you declare that you are measuring in a particular year, are the ones that you're going to be measuring in that year. So you are expected to measure and um, collect data, review it, and modify if necessary based on that analysis. Some portion, if not all of your SLOs, every single year. Well, that wraps up this module on Student Learning Outcomes Assessment. If you have any questions about how or anything that we can do to help you in the Office of Institutional Assessment, be sure to email us at assessment at aa.ufl.edu or you can call our office at 273-1090. Thank you very much for your time this morning.